it all started one night in March of 2020. I came across a movie from the Church of Almighty God online. I'd watched many spiritual movies before, but I had never seen a movie that shocked me like this. But not long after, I looked into the true way. I was getting disturbed by the pastor in religion. The pastor said, you need to know that there is no word of God outside the Bible. Get away from them now. Don't listen to their preaching. But I didn't stop investigating because I had read some of Almighty God's words and I felt these words were indeed the truth. No matter how the pastor and elders disturbed me, I would still follow Almighty God. I believed in the Lord as a child. Later, I became a religion teacher and taught courses on Christian and moral education. And now, I teach in a public secondary school in North Sumatra. What happened to make you accept the gospel of Almighty God of the last days? I saw a movie from the Church of Almighty God online. I remember one night in March 2020, I went on YouTube and I started looking for sermons to use as examples for teaching my students. And late into the night, I ended up watching many sermons, but they were all old, cliché, and offered no light. I felt very bored after watching them. But then I saw a great Christian movie. It was called What a Beautiful Voice. This movie caught my attention right away. There I saw some of Almighty God's words and heard fellowship on how the Lord returns, all of which I'd never heard before. I had watched some spiritual movies before, but I had never seen a film that shocked me like this. After that, I watched another movie God's name has changed, and this made me curious, so I watched it to the end. That night, thinking of what I saw in the movie, I couldn't sleep at all. Was it true? Had God's name really changed? I especially wanted to know, was it just a story? Or was what the movie claimed true, that God had really returned? Were the words they read really the words of God? If God had returned and his name had changed, wouldn't it be bad if I missed it? I was very anxious to find the answers to these questions. Then later, due to the epidemic, I needed to work from home. So I had a lot of time on my hands to watch these movies. I was very happy. I had never seen movies like these. They were good Christian movies. So I began to share these movies on my Facebook timeline out of excitement so that others could also see them. Many people commented that they liked it. But I also saw some words attacking the Church of Almighty God in the comments, and a pastor advised me not to post anything about the Church of Almighty God. What did you think when you heard these objections? Before, I didn't know that these movies were from the Church of Almighty God. I only noticed when the pastor told me about it. Out of curiosity, I searched for the Church of Almighty God on the internet and found a website called Gospel of the Descent of the Kingdom. I started to read the website content, and that's when I saw some of Almighty God's words. Almighty God says, In the kingdom, the myriad things of creation begin to revive and regain their life force. Due to changes in the state of the earth, the boundaries between one land and another also begin to shift. I have prophesied that when land is divided from land and land unites with land, this will be the time I will smash all nations to pieces. At this time, I will renew all of creation and repartition the entire universe, thereby putting the universe in order and transforming the old into the new. This is my plan, and these are my works. 
when the nations and the peoples of the world all return before my throne. I will then take all the bounty of heaven and confer it upon the human world, so that, thanks to me, that world will brim with matchless bounty. But so long as the old world continues to exist, I will hurl forth my rage upon its nations, openly promulgate my administrative decrees throughout the universe, and visit chastisement upon whosoever violates them. As I turn my face to the universe to speak, all mankind hears my voice, and thereupon sees all the works I have wrought throughout the universe. Those who set themselves against my will, that is to say, who oppose me with the deeds of man, will fall under my chastisement. I will take the multitudinous stars in the heavens and make them anew, and thanks to me, the sun and the moon will be renewed. The skies will no longer be as they were, and the myriad things on the earth will be renewed. All will become complete through my words. The many nations within the universe will be partitioned afresh and replaced by my kingdom, so that the nations upon the earth will disappear forever, and all will become a kingdom that worships me. All the nations of the earth will be destroyed and cease to exist. Of the human beings within the universe, all those belonging to the devil will be exterminated, and all who worship Satan will be laid low by my burning fire. That is, except for those now within the stream, all will be turned to ashes. When I chastise the many peoples, those in the religious world will, to varying extents, return to my kingdom, conquered by my works, because they will have seen the advent of the Holy One riding on a white cloud. All people will be separated according to their own kind and will receive chastisements commensurate with their actions. All those who have stood against me will perish. As for those whose deeds on earth have not involved me, they will, because of how they have acquitted themselves, continue to exist on the earth under the governance of my sons and my people. I will reveal myself to the myriad peoples and the myriad nations, and with my own voice, I will sound forth upon the earth, proclaiming the completion of my great work for all mankind to see with their own eyes. These words shook my heart, and I actually felt it tremble. The authority in these words shocked me. There was a majesty that brooked no offense. I felt these words had authority and power. No human could say these words, so they seemed to be from God. It was a feeling that I couldn't express in mere words. At the same time, I was a little confused. I thought the actors in these movies are all Chinese. So were these films made by Chinese people? China is a country ruled by an atheist party, and the Chinese usually burn incense and worship Buddha and idols. Could the Lord have returned to China? Are these words really the words of God? I was very confused. The more confused I became, the more I wanted to understand what was going on. So then, I found their contact information which was displayed on their website, and through there, I was connected with a sister. She asked me if I'd like to go to a meeting. I said, I wanted to know more about the word and truth of Almighty God. 
So she helped me join an online meeting group and read Almighty God's words to me and fellowshiped on the mysteries of God's incarnation and God's three stages of work. I listened carefully to her fellowship and finally found answers to my confusion. And also, I received some really amazing good news that the Lord really has returned and He has come in incarnate flesh. You must have been excited. Yes, I was. But not long after, I was again disturbed and hindered by a pastor in religion. A pastor had sent some words to me, attacking the Church of Almighty God on Facebook, saying, The Church of Almighty God is heresy. They say Almighty God's words are the words of God, but those words are not in the Bible. As a Christian, you need to know that there is no word of God outside the Bible. Get away from them now. Other brothers and sisters in the group also started receiving messages from the pastor. Some people whom I got along well with quit the meeting group after listening to the pastor and advised me to quit as well. This was a hindrance for you, but also a test. Hmm. At first, I was actually confused. I thought, he is a pastor and knows more about the Bible than I do. Maybe he is right. So I wanted to figure out whether the Church of Almighty God was heresy or not. Mm. You didn't stop investigating. Mm. I didn't believe what the pastor said so lightly, because I had read some of Almighty God's words, and I felt these words were indeed the truth. The words had authority. They sounded like God's words. Mm. But these words were indeed beyond the Bible. So what was really going on? I sought with Sister Elsa from the Church of Almighty God, and she sent me a wonderful verse from the Bible, verse 25 from chapter 21 of the Gospel of John. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Sister Elsa fellowshiped with me. From the verse we just read, we can clearly see that the Lord Jesus' words and deeds are not fully recorded in the Bible. At that time, the Apostle John was with the Lord Jesus, and he heard many more of the Lord Jesus' words than are written down in the Bible. Now let's think about this. When the Lord Jesus worked, he preached at least three years of sermons. If he had spoken for at least an hour every day, how much would he have said over three years? It would have been a lot. Much more than anyone could count. So how could his words be only those words recorded in the Bible? Right. Actually, God's words in the Bible are very limited. These are definitely not everything God said during that time. This is an undeniable fact. The pastor says, there is none of God's words outside the Bible. But what is his basis for saying that? I heard that and thought, yeah, what the pastor said doesn't match the facts. It's a mistake. Exactly. You know, I had read the Bible, but I never paid attention to this verse that's in the Gospel of John. Only then did I realize this verse here already tells us that not all of the words of God are in the Bible. Hmm, yes. I remember the prophecy of the Old Testament, Prophet Ezra, isn't in the Bible either. <laughs> yeah. Sister Elsa then went ahead and sent me a few more Bible verses to read. She sent me John 16, 12 through 13. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And she sent me several verses from Revelation. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. 
And one of the elders said to me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. After we read the Bible verses, Sister Elsa fellowshiped. The Lord Jesus' words are very clear. He still has many things to tell us. But the people at the time weren't able to accept it. So the Spirit of Truth will come in the last days to guide and lead us into all truth. Which means, when Lord Jesus returns, He will express more truth, and He will tell us what's to come. This can prove that God has new work and words outside of the Bible. How can people say, the Bible holds all of God's words. Apart from that, there are none of God's words or work. Isn't this denying the Word of God? Yes. This is what many pastors say, and most believers listen to it and never discern what it is. That's right. After her fellowship, I well understood that defining God's words and work as limited to the Bible was totally mistaken, and that God will say more words in the last days, far more than what the Bible records. Revelation mentions that no one can open or read the closed scroll. So the scroll is clearly not the Bible, because we can read the Bible every day. When the Lord Jesus returns, He will open the scroll and tell us its contents. This made it clear to me that God will speak new words that are beyond the Bible. Then we read some of Almighty God's words. The things that are recorded in the Bible are limited. They cannot represent the work of God in its entirety. The four Gospels have fewer than 100 chapters altogether in which are written a finite number of happenings, such as Jesus cursing the fig tree, Peter's three denials of the Lord, Jesus appearing to the disciples following His crucifixion and resurrection, teaching about fasting, teaching about prayer, teaching about divorce, the birth and genealogy of Jesus, Jesus' appointment of the disciples, and so forth. However, man values them as treasures, even comparing the work of today against them. They even believe that all the work Jesus did in His life amounted only to so much, as if God were only capable of doing this much and nothing further. Is this not absurd? At the time, Jesus only gave His disciples a series of sermons in the Age of Grace on such subjects as how to practice, how to gather together, how to supplicate in prayer, how to treat others, and so forth. The work He carried out was that of the Age of Grace, and He expounded only on how the disciples and those who followed Him ought to practice. He only did the work of the Age of Grace and none of the work of the last days. When Jehovah set down the Old Testament law in the Age of Law, why did He not then do the work of the Age of Grace? Why did He not make clear in advance the work of the Age of Grace? Would this not have helped man to accept it? He only prophesied that a male infant would be born and come to power but He did not carry out in advance the work of the Age of Grace. The work of God in each age has clear boundaries. He does only the work of the current age and never carries out the next stage of work in advance. Only thus can His representative work of each age be brought to the fore. Jesus spoke only of the signs of the last days, of how to be patient and how to be saved, of how to repent and confess, and of how to bear the cross and endure suffering. Never did He speak of how man in the last days should achieve entry, nor of how he should seek to satisfy God's will. As such, is it not ridiculous to search the Bible for God's work of the last days? What can you see by merely clutching the Bible, be it an expositor of the Bible or a preacher? Who could have seen the work of today in advance? Almighty God's words made me understand that the Bible is just a history book. It records the two stages of work performed by God in the Age of Law and the Age of Grace. 
and both the Old Testament and the New Testament were compiled by people many years later, after the work of God. It was only after God worked that records of it appeared in the Bible. Therefore, God's words and work in the last days couldn't be recorded in the Bible in advance. If we limit God to the Bible and think there are none of God's words outside the Bible, this is an extremely absurd view. Yes. The pastor's disturbance didn't stop you. Instead, through seeking, you understood the truth. Thank God I did. I had believed in the Lord for decades, but only then did I understand what the Bible was. Thanks be to God. Then Sister Elsa continued her fellowship. She said, God is the source of life, and His words are endless and they are infinite. From creation to the present, God has always been speaking, working, leading to supply and save people. God's work has never been constrained by any person or thing, let alone the Bible. God speaks new words and does new work based on His management plan and the needs of man, and His work never repeats. In the age of law, Jehovah God promulgated the law to lead people in living on the earth and said many words. But in the age of grace, the Lord Jesus preached the way of repentance, worked to redeem humankind, and said much. These words are not recorded in the Old Testament and are completely outside it. Almighty God has come in the last days to express the truth on the basis of Lord Jesus' work, to do the work of judgment beginning with the house of God which thoroughly purifies and saves humankind from sin and its bondage and brings people into God's kingdom. This is a newer and higher stage of work, something impossible for the Bible to have recorded in advance. Right. If we blindly use the Bible to evaluate and delimit God's work, then we become people who resist God, just like the Pharisees who resisted the Lord Jesus. They stubbornly clung to Scripture, madly condemned and resisted the Lord Jesus for His words and His work beyond the Old Testament, and then finally nailed the Lord Jesus to the cross. It was such a tragedy. Then we read two more passages of Almighty God's Word. Almighty God says, The Jewish Pharisees used the law of Moses to condemn Jesus. They did not seek compatibility with the Jesus of that time, but diligently followed the law to the letter, to the extent that, after having charged him with not following the law of the Old Testament and not being the Messiah, they ultimately nailed the innocent Jesus to the cross. What was their substance? Was it not that they didn't seek the way of compatibility with the truth? They obsessed over each and every word of Scripture while paying heed neither to my will nor to the steps and methods of my work. They were not people who sought the truth, but people who rigidly clung to words. They were not people who believed in God, but people who believed in the Bible. Essentially, they were watchdogs of the Bible. In order to safeguard the interests of the Bible, to uphold the dignity of the Bible, and to protect the reputation of the Bible, they went so far as to nail the merciful Jesus to the cross. This they did merely for the sake of defending the Bible and for the sake of maintaining the status of each and every word of the Bible in people's hearts. So they preferred to forsake their future and the sin offering to condemn Jesus, who did not conform to the doctrine of Scripture, to death, were they not all lackeys to each and every word of Scripture? After all, which is greater, God or the Bible? Why must God work according to the Bible? Could it be that God has no right to exceed the Bible? 
Can God not depart from the Bible and do other work? Why did Jesus and his disciples not keep the Sabbath? If he were to keep the Sabbath and practice according to the commandments of the Old Testament, why did Jesus not keep the Sabbath after he came, but instead washed feet, covered head, broke bread, and drank wine? Is this not all absent from the commandments of the Old Testament? If Jesus honored the Old Testament, why did he break with these doctrines? You should know which came first, God or the Bible. Being the Lord of the Sabbath, could he not also be the Lord of the Bible? Yeah, delimiting and resisting God is very serious. Yeah. She continued her fellowship. Just like the Pharisees, pastors and elders resist the Lord Jesus. They blindly worship the Bible, and they also treat the Bible as God. They always defend the book, but they never seek God's footsteps and never listen to see if it's God's voice. They see that the words and work of Almighty God are not recorded in the Bible, so they frantically condemn, resist, and try to hinder people from investigating the true way. Aren't they just modern Pharisees then? They can't see that the Bible is simply a record of God's past work, a book that believers in God must read. But the Bible can't represent God, nor can it work on God's behalf to save people. If people believe in God, yet only follow the Bible and God's words and work in the past, they can't gain the truth and life. What matters most is keeping up with God's footsteps and being freed from sin by accepting His judgment. That's the true way to enter God's kingdom. All these truths expressed by Almighty God are the words of the Holy Spirit to the churches. Only these words can completely cleanse and save people, and only this is the way of eternal life that God grants to people in the last days. If we can't keep up with this stage of work, we will be abandoned and cast out by God, and we will fall into disaster and be punished. Yeah, I felt I gained a lot from the Sisters' Fellowship. Once I had an objective understanding of the Bible, I no longer felt disturbed. Thank God. I saw from this that each time God appears and works, religious leaders resist God and become hostile to Him. To protect their own interests, they create all kinds of fallacies to condemn God's work and stop people from accepting the true way. If you don't understand the truth and can't discern, their slander will ultimately deceive you. You will follow them in resisting and rejecting God and lose God's salvation, which is really very tragic. Yes. Many who believe in the Lord listen to their pastors in this way and lack discernment. Yeah. That's when I told myself, I must equip myself with the truth and learn discernment. I don't want to reject God. Thank God. So then about a month later, another pastor kept messaging me via messenger and WhatsApp and was bothering me. He said, the Lord Jesus was born 2,000 years ago, fulfilling biblical prophecy. Now you say that the Lord has returned as a woman. Does the Bible say that the Lord would come as a woman? It's impossible for the Lord to come incarnate more so as a woman. The Almighty God you believe in is a person. At the same time, two other pastors attacked me together. They judged and condemned, saying my beliefs were wrong. What did you think when you heard them say that? I told them that we cannot define God. God's essence is spirit. Because his work required it, he became flesh and took the form of a man. We believe in Almighty God because he has divine essence, and he's able to express truth, not because of his appearance. I also saw it with Sister Elsa, and we fellowshiped. Many prophecies in the Bible speak of God's incarnation as the Son of Man in the last days, such as the coming of the Son of Man, the Son of Man is revealed, and the Son of Man comes. Now, Almighty God has come to express the truth and do the work of judgment in the last days, which completely fulfills these prophecies. God comes as a woman in the last days, which is indeed inconsistent with human notions. 
but the less God's work aligns with our notions, the more it contains a mystery and is significant. So you may ask, what are the truths and mysteries regarding God's incarnation as a woman? Let's read Almighty God's Word and find out. When she finished, my sister sent me God's Word. Each stage of work done by God has its own practical significance. Back then, when Jesus came, He came in male form. And when God comes this time, His form is female. From this, you can see that God's creation of both men and women can be of use in His work. And with Him, there is no distinction of gender. When His Spirit comes, He can take on any flesh He pleases, and that flesh can represent Him, whether male or female. It can represent God as long as it is His incarnate flesh. With God, there is no distinction of gender. He does His work as He wishes, and in doing His work, He is not subject to any restrictions, but is especially free Yet every stage of work has its own practical significance. God became flesh twice, and it is self-evident that His incarnation during the last days is the final time. He has come to make known all His deeds. If in this stage He did not become flesh in order personally to do work for man to witness, man would forever cling to the notion that God is only male, not female. Before this, all humanity believed that God could only be male and that a female could not be called God. If God came into the flesh only as a male, people would define him as male, as the God of men, and would never believe him to be the God of women. Men would then hold that God is of the same gender as men, that God is the head of men, but what then of women? This is unfair. Is it not preferential treatment? If this were the case, then all those whom God saved would be men like Him, and not one woman would be saved. When God created mankind, He created Adam and He created Eve. He did not only create Adam, but made both male and female in His image. God is not only the God of men, He is also the God of women. Sister Elsa continued her fellowship. God is spirit, but when He incarnates as the Son of Man, He has to take a human form with a gender. The first time, God came incarnate as a man, and in the last days, He becomes a woman. He does this to make people better understand God and know not to delimit Him. In the beginning, God created humans in His image. He created not only man, but also woman. Therefore, the incarnate God can be a male or a female. If God's incarnation is always male, then people will determine that God is only male, and thus mistakenly think that God is the God of men and that He only saves men, not women. Isn't this misunderstanding God? Right. In God's eyes, men and women are equal. Both men and women can be saved by God because both men and women are created by God. We should know that no matter whether God incarnates in a male or female form, He is still God, and God's essence will never, ever change. And He can still express the truth and complete the work of saving humankind. Yeah. We can't deny God's incarnation, appearance, and work because He chose to incarnate as a woman in this age. Many people become stuck here welcoming the Lord. When they hear God's incarnation is a woman, they directly deny it and refuse to investigate. That's very true. Later, I read some words of Almighty God that brightened my heart. Let go of your opinions about the impossible. The more that people believe something is impossible, the more likely it is to occur because the wisdom of God soars higher than the heavens. God's thoughts are higher than man's thoughts, and the work of God transcends the limits of man's thinking and notions. The more that something is impossible, the more it has truth that can be sought. The more something lies beyond man's notions and imagination, 
the more it contains the will of God. The appearance of God cannot be reconciled with man's notions. Still less can God appear at the behest of man. God makes his own choices and his own plans when he does his work. Moreover, he has his own objectives and his own methods. Whatever work he does, he has no need to discuss it with man or seek his advice, much less to notify each and every person of his work. This is the disposition of God, which should, moreover, be recognized by everyone. If you desire to witness the appearance of God, to follow God's footsteps, then you must first walk away from your own notions. You must not demand that God do this or that, much less should you place him within your own confines and limit him to your own notions. Instead, you should demand of yourselves how you ought to seek God's footprints, how you ought to accept God's appearance, and how you ought to submit to the new work of God. This is what man should do. Since man is not the truth, and is not possessed of the truth, he should seek, accept, and obey. Sister Elsa reminded me, looking back on God's work, it often doesn't conform to human notions. If people do not seek the truth, it is too easy to resist God. For example, the Lord Jesus came and was born in a manger. Did this conform to human notions? The Lord Jesus was from Nazareth and not called the Messiah. Did this conform to human notions? The Lord Jesus was God, but he did not enter the temple or keep the Sabbath, and he was hunted down and nailed to a cross. Did this conform to human notions? This doesn't conform to human notions at all. Right. Much about the Lord Jesus' appearance and work wasn't in line with people's notions. Can we therefore say that the Lord Jesus is not God? Of course not. The Lord Jesus was the appearance of God, the coming of the Messiah. Then why did so many people not know him and even condemn and resist him? Isn't it just because people use their notions and imaginations to evaluate God? The Pharisees said Lord Jesus was but a Nazarene, a carpenter's son, and not God. In the end, they went so far as to crucify the Lord and were cursed and punished by God. Today, religious pastors and elders delimit God based on their notions and imaginations denying and resisting the work of Almighty God. This is repeating the mistakes of the Pharisees and crucifying God all over again. Yes. People's tendency to define and resist God is a very serious problem. Yes, that's very true. God is the Creator, and He works according to His plan, without any restrictions. No matter what God does, He has His wisdom. We cannot use our notions and imaginations to delimit where God should work or in what manner He should appear. Our attitude toward God should be obedience. Obedience means accepting God's words and work, as well as understanding God through His words and work, instead of using our notions and imaginations to define and limit God and saying God cannot do this or that, which is too irrational. Right. Then, Sister Elsa, went ahead and read me two more passages of God's word. If man intends to inquire into whether it is God's incarnate flesh, then he must corroborate this from the disposition he expresses and the words he speaks, which is to say, to corroborate whether or not it is God's incarnate flesh and whether or not it is the true way, one must discriminate on the basis of his essence. And so, in determining whether it is the flesh of God incarnate, the key lies in His essence, His work, His utterances, His disposition, and many other aspects, rather than external appearance. If man scrutinizes only his external appearance, and as a result, overlooks his essence, this shows that man is benighted and ignorant. When God becomes flesh, he merely descends from heaven into a particular flesh. It is his spirit that descends into a flesh through which he does the work of the spirit. 
It is the spirit that is expressed in the flesh, and it is the spirit who does his work in the flesh. The work done in the flesh fully represents the spirit, and the flesh is for the sake of the work. But that does not mean that the image of the flesh is a substitute for the true image of God himself. This is not the purpose or the significance of God becoming flesh. He becomes flesh only so that the spirit may find a place to reside that suits his working, the better to achieve his work in the flesh, so that people can see his deeds, understand his disposition, hear his words, and know the wonder of his work. His name represents his disposition. His work represents his identity. But he has never said that his appearance in the flesh represents his image. That is merely a notion of man. She continued her fellowship. And it doesn't matter at all if God's incarnation is male or female. And it doesn't matter at all what he looks like. What matters is whether what he says is the truth, whether he expresses God's disposition, and if he does the work of saving humankind. This is what is important. Right. For example, if we go to the doctor when we are sick, what we focus on is whether the doctor can cure our disease, not whether the doctor is male or female. If we say that only male doctors can treat diseases, but females can't, isn't that ridiculous? Therefore, as long as he can express the truth and do the work of saving humankind, then he is truly God incarnate. This aspect of the truth is crucial. Yeah. But religious pastors don't listen for God's voice or investigate the true way. And when they hear that God has incarnated as a woman, they deny and condemn it and spread notions to hinder people from welcoming the Lord. It's a mistake. It's a terrible mistake. To stop them from disturbing me, I blocked all the people who tried to hinder me, including the pastor and elders of my original church. I believed firmly that I was welcoming the Lord and no matter how anyone disturbed me, I would follow Almighty God. The pastor's disturbances only gave you more discernment of them. This is a good thing. Yeah. I heard that the pastor instigated your family to stop you after that. Mm. Since April 2020, my daughter and I, we both stopped going to church. Two months later, the pastor of the church started attacking me. First, he came to my house to persuade me not to attend the meetings of the Church of Almighty God, saying meetings in his church were enough. He also told my husband I took the wrong path and that I should stay clear of it and tried to get my son to stop me from believing. Oh, what was your family's attitude to this? My husband and children were against the pastor's approach. My children said, I preached the gospel to them and I often spoke of matters of belief in God with them. So they all thought my belief in Almighty God was thoroughly considered and that I gained the confidence in God to make this decision. Later, the elders threatened me, saying if I didn't go to church, I would be expelled and everyone there would reject me. I resolutely said, even if the church expels me, I will believe in Almighty God. Thank God. Once you understand God's work, you can stand firm in the true way. Yes. Later, the elders told the leaders of my school about my belief in Almighty God, hoping the school would deal with me, but the principal completely ignored them. I thought of what Sister Elsa said to me, that the truth is always rejected and condemned by the religious world. 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus expressed the truth to redeem humankind, and he was condemned and rejected by Judaism especially by the religious leaders, chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees. They attacked and blasphemed the Lord Jesus to keep their positions and income and stopped people from following the Lord. They were all antichrists who resisted God and ruined people. Today, most pastors and elders in the religious world are just the same as the Pharisees in Judaism. To protect their own positions and income, they condemn and resist the appearance and work of Almighty God and prevent believers from investigating the true way. They are also antichrists who have been revealed by God. Yeah. Then I thought of what the Lord Jesus said when he cursed the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! 
For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Religious pastors and elders know Almighty God's words are the truth, but don't accept them. They just want to enjoy people's worship and offerings. So to maintain their positions, they stop us from welcoming the Lord and entering God's kingdom. Mm. This is what antichrists do. Exactly. They are all demons that devour people's souls, and they will all be cursed by God, and those who follow them will also go to hell and be punished. Yes. And although I'm still often attacked and disturbed by pastors and elders, no matter what fallacies they spread, I am no longer affected. Because I know the words expressed by Almighty God are the truth, and the way of eternal life that purifies and saves people. Mm. Anyone who sincerely longs to seek God's appearance should read Almighty God's words, and they will recognize God's voice and return to Almighty God's throne. Amen. Thank God. Thanks be to God.